All right, my friends, welcome back to another episode of the Build Show webinar. That's right, guys. We're back from the Rockwell Studios here in Austin, Texas, and we got a fantastic topic today. You know I love nerding out about HVAC, and we are specifically talking about the V today in the HVAC ventilation. We're talking about fresh air systems, and we are going to really go down a nerdy rabbit hole about Zender equipment, Zender installs, and what I think of as the world's best fresh air equipment. So let me introduce uh, who's with me in the studios. First, I've got Sabi from Zender. Sabi, thank you for joining me. Uh, and tell us, Sabi, what you do with Zender. Hey, Matt, and hey, everyone. Uh, I am one of the coding engineer and tech support at Zender America. My main job is to deal with the quotes and helping people with any kind of technical questions on installation or any kind of software issues or operational problems. Love it, Sabi. Sabi, trust me, is a big nerd like me, so we're going to have a lot of fun today. And speaking of nerds, we've got another of our nerdy friends on the line. Uh, hopefully you guys can see Albert uh, with Small Planet Supply. Uh, Albert's zooming in from the uh, green room all the way in the uh, Pacific Northwest in Vancouver, British Columbia. Albert, thank you for joining us. Yeah. Good morning or afternoon or whatever time zone we're in. <laughs> um, hey, Matt. Hey, everybody. Um, here I am in the green slash blue room up here in the Northwest. Man, appreciate you joining us, Albert. So uh, for everybody watching, whether you're watching this live or whether you're watching this recorded, we're going to go for about the next hour or so, Masi Menos. Uh, and we're going to first lead off with Albert, who's going to give us a bit of a, a presentation, because I think as we talk about these systems, it's really important for us to have a good understanding of uh, why fresh air and then what does it look like to deliver that fresh air to our houses, to our to our buildings. And Albert's uh, got some really cool slides because he's actually going to be showing us a range of different projects from small projects, multifamily projects kind of all kinds of different housing uh, and also kind of running through a little bit of the of the Zender catalog because these guys have a lot of different equipment. Now, I'm sure if you're watching this, I guess I'm not 100 percent. If you're watching this, you've probably seen my personal house. Uh, I've got the uh, the Q600 in my attic and I made a bunch of really long videos. <laughs> if you haven't seen those, feel free to check those out. Uh, talking about my system from the install to the commissioning to even like here's how I service that six months later. Uh, but we're going to leave time at the end of this uh, hour, probably the last 15, 20 ish minutes, something like that for Q&A, because I suspect a lot of you that are on the line today have some questions. And we've got about 150 so 150 people live uh, from their Zooms at home listening in. And by the way, if you're watching this on the recorded version, uh, sign up for our newsletter so you can know about when these webinars are happening, because we're sending a newsletter out. Tuesdays and Fridays, and that's when we're announcing these. Uh, but with that being said, I'm going to pass the mic and the screen controls over to uh, Albert. Uh, Albert, give us the uh, give us the full presentation, brother. Talk to us about fresh air and what we need to know about Zender. All right. Um, oh, I'm that. sorry. One last thing, Albert. I forgot to okay. have you tell me who you are and what you do. I'm sorry, oh, brother. Well, yeah, I, I suppose you, that I, might be useful. I glossed so right over that. So my name is Albert Brooks. Uh, I'm the CEO of Small Planet Supply. I founded Small Planet Supply uh, back in 2010. And for the last 10 years, I've worked on ventilation um, a, a lot, a whole lot with Zender equipment. Um, we've had a longstanding relationship with them. And over the last 10 years, we've done lots of you know very tiny projects, single family projects, and lots and lots of multifamily projects. Um, I typically do a lot of educational uh, sessions uh, around the ventilation subject. And so here's a, a few slides about, you know, kind of talking about why we do, why ventilation and things like that. So um, this is actually a slide out of, uh, doesn't matter whether it's passive house training or code training, um, it all starts kind of down with the same thing. Uh, it's a bit of a comic, but the reason we do ventilation is really people. Um, after we start thinking about people and what the impact on the uh, on the load of the building is, uh, it gets a little more interesting because then we're really trying to manage energy loss. But really, the first thing is we've got people inside of buildings. Buildings are getting tighter. Air barriers are, are getting more attention all the way around. And some of them, 
you know, are down to 0 0.6 and tighter. I see lots of 0 0.3 air changes an hour and 0 0.4. No matter what it is, the air barriers are getting Ventilation is about people and comfort and health first. After we satisfy comfort and health, we're looking to do that with the smallest energy penalty that we can. And as we move through it, uh, we are trying to really manage uh, along with CO2, which is what we exhale, and having plenty of fresh oxygen to inhale and feel healthy and comfortable, we also have to manage the humidity. We have to manage the humidity for people. Uh, and so we want to kind of keep it in that green box range or maybe the gray box range, no matter where we are. It could be up in my home of Olympia, Washington, or we could be down in Austin, Texas, right? Olympia, Washington, cold and dry in the winter. Eastern Washington, even colder and drier. Tahoe, cold and dry. Saskatchewan, cold and dry. But down in Austin, Atlanta, uh, hot and humid, right? So there's, mm -hmm. there's things about humidity to manage on both sides. Mm -hmm. As we go forward and we look at how we do ventilation, it's pretty much like Matt's house. Matt's house looks like this. I'm not saying it's a small house. I'm saying <laughs> that when we supply ventilation, we supply it into the green areas, into the places where people occupy. So we'll send supply uh, flows into bedrooms and to living rooms, bedrooms primarily, and there's a, a couple of slides about why we do that. But basically, we want to have a long good night's sleep without having a high CO2 level inside the bedroom. So we supply lots of air into it. And then we pull air out of kitchens and baths. Um, and there's real simple ways that we come up with flow calculations on how to accomplish that. And then the middle spaces in the home, however many hallways or entryways there are, those are all just kind of crossover. So if we look at this map, it's a positive pressure zone in the green plus signs and negative pressure zones because we're actually pulling air out with a fan in the HRV. And so positive uh, positive pressure goes to negative pressure zones, and we generally try to wash or cascade the air across the entire home. And as the buildings get better and the insulation quality gets better and the air tightness gets better, and you know, even when you get up to net zero and you know, super insulated homes, uh, the surface to air, uh, I'm sorry, the um surface temperature uh, gets more uniform across the house and we we can't even really define rely on the eddies or the temperature differentials to drive the air. As we get into the equipment and we're injecting plenty of fresh air uh, um, into the home, we want to get that lowest energy penalty. So where the industry came from, you know, 20 years ago and uh, way back, if anybody knows the Saskatchewan house, which had the first ERV built in North America back in the 70s, um, normal equipment we can see has this lower right hand kind of 40 to 60 percent efficiency range. And then as we move left, basically those higher percentages is the amount of heat loss across the building. So in this case, a higher percentage is a good number to get uh, because as we create the heat inside the building, we want to inject a lot of fresh air into the building, but we don't want to pull that energy out of the building. We want to keep it in the building. So when you think about it, the HRV is really um, part of the thermal boundary of the building. It's part of the insulation layer, the air tightness layer. Um, so getting a higher efficiency just means that we need smaller heating equipment. It doesn't need to work as hard. And if we're in hot and humid, we don't need to dehumidify. We don't need to cool as much. Same thing works on that end. In a home where this is working, um, it's really easy to tell. And here's really what happens. So this is a house that was built in 2014. It's got Zender equipment in it and um, newly constructed, uh, super insulated, very airtight, hit tighter than 0 0.6 ACH 50. And the top lines are the internal temperatures. So that's the temperature in the house in April with no heat turned on. Families in it, they're occupied, and, and the, the heating system hasn't been turned on. So you can see that the top line is really the actual temperature in the building. That's the return flows coming back from kitchen and bath. And it's hovering near 70 all the time. And the lower sets of lines are the temperature outdoors. So that's fresh air coming in from outdoors. And then the blue line above that is the uh, exhaust air 
after it goes through the heat recovery core and head, is heading back out. And so the interesting part of this is, this is how well the equipment works when it's matched with a really good building envelope. And then you can also see a funny little bump every day. So this is like five days. Every day has got that little bump. And the, the nerdy fun part of this question is, if anybody can guess what that little bump represents, I'll tell you what it is because it's just me talking now. So I'd love, I love actually the interaction about it, but that's the morning shower. So when you think about it, all that hot water comes out huh. of the tank, spills into the bathroom. Now we got a whole bunch of heat. That heat shows up in the return air at the HRV and we pick it up. And then you can see the corresponding bump go after it goes through the HRV and it comes back into supply air. Um, so that's when they really work. That's a killer slide, Albert. Sorry to interrupt. Uh, yeah. I really like that slide. I did want to say one other quick thing to interrupt. Uh, yeah. As Albert's going through these, he doesn't have audience interaction, but how you can ask Albert a question is yeah. to throw your question on the Q&A tab. If you're uh, familiar with Zoom, somewhere in your Zoom thing, for me on my phone, it's on the top. Uh, there's a Q&A tab. Throw your questions in the Q&A and I'll moderate those. Uh, if it's an Albert question, feel free to direct it to Albert, and I'll throw it out to Albert at the end. If it's a Sabi or a me question, or if it's just a general question, no problem. Throw it on that tab, and I'll get to it. Keep going, Albert. Uh, yeah, Mark, we're going to discuss ERVs, and um, i got to remember if I've got the right slide for that. I think I do. So hang on to that question, and we'll get there. Um, so the next thing I'm going to do is just bump forward one slide. And, and so, you know, we deal with very, very small projects. So here's a project built in Oregon. It's a tiny house. It's going to be occupied by a person. And so in this house, we put in, or the, or the builder, uh, we can see him there, Dylan Lamar, super nice guy, uh, put in a little CA70. And a little CA70 is a really cool little device. It's an ERV. Um, so an ERV also captures humidity or functions in humidity. So in the Northwest, an ERV will um, kind of maintain the humidity inside the enclosure uh, when it's cold and dry outside, which doesn't get super cold and dry in Eugene, but it does happen in the winter. Um, it'll actually tend to keep the moisture that people make inside the home. Um, so it doesn't dry out. And what happens when it dries out is you can tell your, your skin gets dry, your lip gets chapped and things like that. So anyway, this Comfortware 70, it just takes one hole through the wall. There's a big white cover there. And then there's a black tube that's kind of hard to see. And then there's that exterior cover that the red arrow is pointing to. So it wants a 12 inch thick wall and, and Dylan doesn't have a 12 inch thick wall for it. So he furred it out on the inside to make it 12 inches thick because uh, we need 12 inches thick because the fan motors are actually placed in that 12 inch diameter insulated round tube. And what's behind the front cover is um, this is a really, really good e ERV. It's got a, um, a effectiveness of I think it's about 80 88 percent at the lower fan speeds and in order to get that kind of efficiency or effectiveness you need a really big surface area so if you ever look at the core of the ERVs you know kind of back a couple of slides ago it's just a whole bunch of plates arranged and and we flow the air past those flat plates and it and it moves from one plate to another in the form of heat or in the form of moisture so the more surface area you got, the more area you've got for heat transfer. So even though that tiny little house only needs maybe 24 CFM uh, continuous ventilation, maybe up to 30, we need a lot, if we can provide more surface area of the heat recovery core on any model, um, we'll get more efficiency. So that white box really isn't the fan motors. It's got a little tiny control. It's mostly just heat recovery core. And because it's an ERV, it doesn't need a condensate drain. So a tiny house is the same as a studio in a multifamily building or a bachelor apartment or, mm. or whatever we want to call them these days, right? It's, it's space where we have maybe a little kitchen and a bed, and then there's a separate bathroom. So the this little device is really interesting. It works in multifamily. We put a bunch of them in multifamilies, new construction and retrofits, because uh, doing a retrofit with this device is, is pretty straightforward and simple. 
But anyway, we just we just put this unit through the wall on that building. It's got a bunch of them in it. Uh, you can see the blue dot down near the windows, kind of at the top of the screen. That's where the unit goes. And the two black lines are two of these Comfoflex tubes that Zabi will show us here in a bit. Uh, and they're running back to a bathroom because we've tooled up a little adapter that will fit on this. And remember, we got two flows. On the upper left, the blue area is return air coming back into the unit. And the upper right, the red arrow, is fresh supply air that's supplying the living space of the unit. So all we got to do is run two pipes to pick up the bathroom uh, and we place a box, a TVA box that Savi will kind of show us later. And we place a box in the bath and we run two tubes back and we hook them up to that unit. And now we don't need a bath fan anymore. And so we've got continuous ventilation at a rate that we can specify inside that multifamily building. And the unit has uh, a MERV 13 filter um, on the intake flow. So we could do that really anywhere. California, which now requires MERV 13 filters. Here's an actual building under construction. I kind of had to ghost the unit in there, but that's where it'll go. And the red lines, the tubes coming back and the blue space is the capture zone in that bath uh, back in that building. Um, as the unit's running, it's gonna conserve about 88% of the heating energy or the cooling energy, doesn't matter which, inside the building. And it'll, it'll consume maybe a whopping 24 watts continuous while it's doing so. No other energy input, that's it, 24 watts. Um, you know, I guess that's, it used to be, uh, you know, near a refrigerator incandescent bulb, but now since they've gone all LEDs, they don't use much energy. Uh, <laughs> anyway, 24 watts is really, really a small number. That's low. Yeah. So in this one, we got rid of the bath fan, right? So this is like a big movement, man. I don't know if you're seeing this happen everywhere, Yep. but in my world, bath fans are going away. Uh, I am so happy about that, Albert. Me too. People get worried about it. And so the way that you deal with clients and, and yourself, you know, as you're as you're making this transition is you just you look at the numbers and the numbers here are really simple. 50 CFM bath fan. We could even bump it up to 60 CFM bath fan. Get a super nice, quiet one. Um, if we when we set it up, we, we could kind of say the average runtime of the bath fan is 20 minutes. Um and if in an, in an average home, maybe it's gonna run five times a day. So we'll go with that number. So look, we're gonna go total CFM is 50 CFM and five cycles a day over 24 hours. So 50 times 20 minutes times four runs a day. Well, I should have said five runs, five. my mistake in math there. So it's 4,000 cubic feet move per day. If we did five runs, it'd be 5,000 cubic feet move per day. So code minimum everywhere, US and Canada, uh, in all cases, in a bath, there's a provision for 20 CFM continuous. So our little CA70 plugged into that little, that little uh, living unit is going to be running at at least 20 CFM continuous pulling out of that bath that runs 24 seven. So the total CFM is really 20 CFM over 24 hours. And I've got the Q&A chat box in front of me. So part of the math is obscure, but it's 20 CFM times 60 minutes and an hour times 24 hours is 28,800 cubic feet moved over a day, which is a big deal. And in this case, we're not pulling in unconditioned air to replace the unconditioned or the conditioned air that we've expelled out of the bath we're running it through an HRV. So we're really not hitting a big energy penalty in doing this. And even if we went back to the bath fan, Matt, and, and you say, you know, Albert, that's crazy. You know, most people are gonna run it 10 times a day. Let's double it. And even accounting for my math there. So five cycles, now 10 cycles, I think we're maybe about 10,000 cubic feet if people remember to turn on the bath fan, if it stays on for 20 minutes, if they use it that much, compared to something that's always running, always doing its job and moving close to 30,000 cubic feet a day. So people like that, and that's great. 
it does take a little longer to take the fog off of the mirrors and things like that because we're not we're moving a little less flow across time. However, when you think about the building, the building bathrooms always get wet. When you see decay and failures in a building, it's always around water. And um, my experience with this is that the baths are now become a pristine zone. The towels dry out, the, sh the shower stall dries out. It's just much, much better for the building. That's my, uh, just to interject here quick, Albert, that's been my experience. Uh, you know, I've got a family of four kids, plus my wife and I at our house with my, uh, my Zender Q running at 100 and I forget what mine is, like 150 CFM, 24-7, 365. My bathroom, mm. super dry. Uh, and yeah. my kids, I guarantee you, never hit the boost function when they're showering. Um, but yet it's you know, always running on function, low and slow. Right. And, you know, so that's a really good point, right? In these systems, um, all of these systems basically provide a button in the bath where you can hit it. And it boosts it up 30%. Um, but it only boosts it up for, you know, 20 minutes and something. And that's really just to pull the fog off of the mirror yep. because we don't really need it for the building. We're mm -hmm. just trying to accelerate it a little bit to take care of a momentary issue. Yep. So it'll, it'll go back to its normal rate, you know, after 20 minutes or something like that. And so, so yeah, so um, super interesting stuff. And, and so what we do in small homes really applies to large buildings. So if I look at this, this could be a one bedroom small home, you know, roughly about 600 square feet, something like that. Um, it's a multifamily building, which is nothing more than a bunch of small homes stacked together with common walls, which are generally more efficient because we have all these common walls. And as long as we get air tightness to them, they work really, really well. So yeah. a building like that, we just put up a little bigger unit, a 160 and a 160 sweet spot is about 50 CFM of flow at the medium range, gives it another 30% boost factor. And really we're just supplying bedrooms and supplying the blue zones and pulling air out of the red zones. The red zones in this case is one bath 20 CFM, one kitchen, probably maybe 24 CFM, uh, which will give me about 48 CFM continuous flow is going to be in the 0.4. Uh, of course, all my Q&A stuff is oh, 0.5. Okay. 0.5 air changes uh, an hour. And as we really want to nerd out, 0.5 is a little high. I don't really want to go that much higher. And that might be a, uh, a point, Matt, that we kind of talk about a little bit separately here I like it. and and uh, oh sorry there we go as we jump ahead and that's what it looks like installed super compact tight you can see the uh, kitchen exhaust has got that white arrow right in front of us with a tva box that savi will show us and um just goes in in a, in a single family it'd be the same we could hang it in the ceiling and hang it high or we could hang it on a wall uh and then as we add another bedroom we can add another two bedrooms. We just step up to a slightly larger unit. This, of all of them, this is still kind of my favorite. I really, really like this unit. Doesn't have all the fancy Wi-Fi controls that we have right now, but this is on planet Earth. This is about the most efficient unit you can get. Uh, the Passive House Institute in Germany is rated at 92% effective. Um, HVI rates it right around 91% effective. It's just super, super good. It's quiet, it's compact, and it'll do the same thing. Just a little more flow. It's got a great core. Albert, HR which model is that? I don't- uh, That's the 200. That's the 200. Yeah, okay. CA200. CA200, 10-4. Yeah, yeah. Um, and it, you know, it's sweet. It's, it's um, um, super efficient unit, easy to install, fits in a 12 inch drop ceiling in multifamily projects or in single family projects. If we want to hang it in a crawl space, hmm. Um, or hang it in an attic, we can do that. Matt, how often do you got to go up to your attic and change the filters? Every and six months. Every so six months. It, you got a nice big old attic with a great stair to go up there and do that? Yep, I do. Well, I've got easy access. I, I made sure to make a nice mechanical space <laughs> for my equipment, but one, I don't always get that in my clients' houses. 
Well, yeah. So, I mean, that's just kind of like the thing. One thing to think about is, right, you've got that every six month relationship with the device Mm -hmm. and maybe the non-skilled owners got that same relationship going forward. So you see these gray little caps at the bottom of this thing. Those are the filters. So you just want to mount these things where someone can get at them twice a year to change the filters. Mm -hmm. Super easy to do. Nothing real technical, but you know, getting a a 60 year old guy like me to slide on his belly in a crawl space is, is, is something. So providing the right space and environment to do that. I did a retrofit and um, it's one of the pictures here. And then there's a really nice install that somebody did in Bellingham, Washington, straight up timber framing company. They're awesome. And so you can guess mine's the ugly one on the left. And these are CA2, <laughs> CA200s two, ca and single family residences. And um, this is where it proves I'm not a builder, but I'm kind of good at ventilation. Um, and, and when I worked on my design, I just kind of looked at all the flow rates and so forth. And the upper, the upper stream is kind of where I started out. And, um, and you just look at, you know, how many kitchens, I, yeah, one kitchen, maybe a master bedroom, another bedroom, they'll all want supply flow. But in North America, it's really about the exhaust flow. When we size systems, when we look at the 20 CFM continuous for exhaust, and we compare that to the norms that that the code wants us or ASHRAE, Uh, of 10 to 15 CFM per person on occupancy. The funny thing about North Americans, we just always have more bathrooms than than might make sense. But in any case, whether it makes sense or not, it means that every time we add a bath, we need another 20 CFM. And if we add a, a, a laundry room on top of that, maybe we need eight or 10 CFM. We add a kitchen, because we might as well be pulling some air out of the kitchen as we go. All that adds up to the higher, Um, a higher requirement for exhaust flow than for supply flow. So in North America, it's all about the exhaust rate. And you can kind of play that. Code kind of wants maybe I've got in that project, I have a master bath with a shower. So I fully need a 20 CFM uh, exhaust rate. And then I've got a little powder, you know, just a, a little toilet in the closet. If I give that 20 CFM, I wind up getting a pretty high rate and it's and it corresponds to a high air exchange rate per hour, which is kind of a volumetric calculation. And 0.42 is okay, but I like 0.32. So I just kind of adjusted my flows down. And you know, we've got people within the company and within the Zender network that look at look at these values and kind of help you with these values. Um, but I would I just kind of move my design down because one of the things that we talked about is is man if we if we put a little building up in Tahoe and it's got an ERV in it and in the winter it's cold and dry and the building has a tendency to dry out we can we can try to keep some moisture in the building by slowing down the the ventilation rate so we lose less because we're always losing a little bit of moisture we make it inside and then we blow it outside and we use an ERV because it'll transfer the moisture across the core and bring it back inside and not let it leave but we always lose some so we can we can reduce the ventilation rate but we don't want to reduce it so that we don't get enough fresh oxygen and push the the um, uh, CO2 out. So we we balance that. And the way we look at that is really by the air exchange rate per hour. And it's, you know, it's kind of like guardrails on a highway. 30 is a low number and you want to kind of stay to the right of that left-hand guardrail. And 0.5 uh, or 0.3 is, is a low number and 0.5 is, is a high number. And a 0.5 air exchange rate in Tahoe means that we're going to lose more moisture than we really need to. We might need to add a dehumidifier. But if we take that same job and we put it in in um, um, Austin, Texas, in the midsummer when it's really high humidity, we have the same problem. You know, we're cooling that building. And as we're cooling that building, we're trying to keep that excess moisture out in the high humidity area. And so by managing the ventilation rate is a way that we can reduce those losses and make the building feel a little bit more comfortable. So this is what we do on the design side. Not everybody has to do that. There's people that'll do that for us. But it's just some of the questions and some of the issues that we deal with. So good, Albert. Keep it up, man. This is fantastic. Okay, good. 
Um, well, so so say we got a project and we've done a design and and we've submitted our design to Zender and Sabi's looked at it and and said, well, I I I I agree with this design. Let's pass it off to Small Planet Supply and Pranov in Vancouver looks at it and he says, okay, you need a CA350 or, or a CAQ350 because we want all the good uh, data things that come along with that. And so here you go. And now it's time to actually install it. So we sent, uh, uh, well, Matt's already done his, but he kind of went through the same experience. We sent a whole bunch of stuff and now it's time to install. And it's, they're really easy to install. So the design is really simple. We Let me, uh, can I pause you for one sec, Albert, just to, yeah, go ahead. because I don't know how, many, how familiar everyone watching is. One of the big things that separates Zender from other <clears throat> manufacturers of ERVs is that they don't just make the equipment, the ERV, the HRV itself, but they also make and sell and engineer all the supply as well. So as you're looking at uh, this slide in particular, the slides at my house, what's really cool, I think, about Zender is that they make the total system. And I love it when manufacturers make the total system and not just here's a part, go figure out how to put this part in that works. But here's uh, all Sabi, the parts. Maybe, maybe Sabi can throw that Comfort Flex up on the yeah, table. Yeah, let's do there. that right now. We're, we're yeah, going yeah. slightly out of order <laughs> so than that's we thought. Right. But... That's right, Matt. So yeah. our goal is not just to bring in the air into the house. We want to be sure that it goes where it's supposed to go mm -hmm. and it comes out from the house where it's supposed to come from. So this yeah. is the flexible line. It's a three inch diameter line, flexible. This is moves the air from the house to the unit and from the unit to the house where it's supposed to go. That's a big difference. Uh, as Albert showed, we want to be sure that we're moving air from kitchens, bathrooms and any part of the house when the air could be contaminated. It could be smell, moisture, high CO2 level, other stuff. And Great. we want to be sure the okay. fresh air goes there. So I put the slide back up because essentially that that gray tube that we're looking at is the same as the white tube with the, the guy in it. And essentially that white tube where the guy is standing, that's where the, the silencer is going to go and where the unit's going to go. Yep. So essentially we're running all these tubes in what we call a home run system. So most ventilation systems up until now, or many of them, I want to say, are a uh, trunk and branch. So we just, you know, we'd, we'd size a unit, maybe run some six inch steel pipe off of it. Um, not so, not, not, uh, not the flex pipe, a steel pipe off of it. And then we branch off into a four inch and a three inch. And, and so it's just kind of like a central trunk with a bunch of branches off of it. And, and so that works, but it's really hard to actually get the airflow to turn those 90 degrees or hit the Ys and get the airflow where we want. We have to run this big rigid spine down the back of the system. They tend to leak and stuff. And so a home run system is where right below, right where that guy is standing, we're actually going to have a ventilation unit. And a ventilation unit is nothing more than a core with two in, in, in a box with two fans, one pushing, one pulling. And those two, and one of those fans will reach up into that manifold where those white tubes are connected and pressurize that manifold and push all that airflow out to wherever we've run those tubes. So I'm going to take two tubes and I'm going to run them to the master bedroom or maybe three tubes. I'll take another two tubes and run them to maybe the living room or some public space like that. I'll take one tube, run it to a little bedroom, a single occupancy bedroom, because one tube is about the right airflow and everything's designed to, to hit those numbers so people don't really have to kind of think and stop and pull out a calculator or a code check or something when they're installing these things. So, uh, and a home run means that when the air at the unit hits that manifold, it's evenly pushed into those tubes. So wherever we'll run the tube is where the airflow will show up. And we can really be relied how much airflow is gonna show up at the end in the bedroom or the bathroom or wherever it's going. So we just start at the beginning, run the tubes, hook them up to a manifold, run the tubes across the building, single family, multifamily, we can put them in chases. If, you, if you're building with open web trusses, that makes it really simple to do two floor designs where you can kind of poke down into one floor and poke up into the other floor. 
lots of ways. They're just three inch diameter tubes and they're double helix. You can't crush them. So you don't really have to worry about that. And you just try to send it out there smooth and easy so that you don't have too many hard 90 degree bends. Uh, that way the airflow just flows with the least amount of resistance. And at the end of the end of the run, wherever, whatever room we're serving, either serving with supply air or serving with return air, we just put one of those steel boxes that, that Zabi will show us here in a little bit. And the steel box will just uh, collect the flow for us or distribute the flow for us. So hey. it's really that simple. It's not, it's not hard. Um, and in every building, it looks a little bit different, but it's really, you know, it's really just start at the beginning, run a bunch of tube like spaghetti and set the terminations at the end and connect the tubes up to it and then install the unit. Um, in commercial spaces, it's easy to set a drop, work around sprinklers in California, however you need to. Uh, and then at the end, you just hook them up to your unit. And I guess it's, it's really nice to be able to actually see the equipment. So I'm gonna flip it back to, to uh, uh, build central there. And we got the equipment sitting on the table. So the tall box there is just a two tube box. We could hook two tubes to it, point it down and from the ceiling. And uh, right where Matt's hand is, we'd trim that up to the drywall. Uh, and there we go. There's a couple of, there's a bracket that's kind of hidden that, that you can, you know, side, you can reverse the bracket and hook it up to the framing. And then at the end, yeah. So there's a, there's a supply return and I can't tell if that's a supply or, a or a return. That's a supply. That's a supply. Yeah. Okay. And uh, they, so what happens is just like yeah, Edward said, we're going to cut this flush with the drywall. So this can poke mm -hmm. down however we need. And this would be like a ceiling mount, right? I'm, I'm kind of showing this coming yeah. down through the ceiling. It could mm -hmm. uh, be a sidewall as well if we wanted It'd be a to. a sidewall. Uh, yeah. And what's really cool, and I know a bunch of you have asked this question. Uh, this really got me the first time I saw a crew installing them up in Vancouver. This was one of Albert's projects. The carpentry crew was installing the Zender system, yeah. <laughs> not an HVAC yeah. guy, guy. The carpenters yeah. were running these and I was like, this look like shop vac tubes. You know, it they're is. They're basically just a shop vac home run tube, right? When you hook up your, your rigid shop vac on the job, you hook it to the blower and then you got a, a the end nozzle that's your, you know, your car nozzle, let's say. And as long as it's connected, it works great. Same with this. And what's cool about it is the carpenters, when they're installing this, they aren't like, oh, we got to measure out 22 feet of pipe. It doesn't matter because here's the secret sauce. And this is when I finally understood this was when everything kind of came together in my mind. Whether this outlet is 20 feet or 100 feet from the machine, it's the same shop vac tubes. Each one of these tubes runs about 12 CFMs. So let's yep. say if this outlet here was, was calculated at, uh, let's say we needed 18 CFM in my daughter's yep. bedroom, we'd run two yep. of these tubes. And then it doesn't matter how long those tubes are, because what happens is at the end, someone that's been Zender trained is going to come out and commission the system. And this is the final uh, uh, this is the final termination. So this is what it looks like at your drywall. It kind of looks like a smoke detector. And what's crazy about it is you take this little uh, beauty connector off, if I can get it off. And then underneath here, it's going to be a little hard to see on camera, but underneath here is this distribution bar that if I, uh, Sabi, help me out here, if I sure. unsnap this. No, oh, it's hard to do actually, unless it's. What do you do for me, brother? He's done it more than I have. When you unsnap this little cap on here, it's going to release here we go. the- uh, uh, Locking mechanism. Mechanism. And then now this mechanism can go up and down. And so at the final commissioning, you're going to have a commissioning agent, you know, a person who's going to come out to your job. They're going to put a flow hood on this. So if this is on my ceiling, you know, put a flow hood on there and they're going to go around the whole house. And whether it's an exhaust or a supply, they're going to go back to the engineering report and go, OK, I'm supposed to have 18 CFM here. Boop. Let's pop the flow hood on. Oh, we're at 24 CFM. Doop, 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 doop. Let me clank this down. Let's check the flow again. Oh, boom. We're at 19 CFM. We're right. We're, you know, we're right within 10 percent of where we needed to be. And again, it didn't matter whether this tube was 20 feet long or 100 feet long because it's pushing all out from the same supply 
And then in each individual outlet, we're going to, at the end of the process, commission it. And what's it's one of the things that I think just absolutely separates Zender from the other manufacturers is that this is a system that gets commissioned and you get a verification from a third party that it was installed correctly, that it's working correctly, that you're actually getting the flow. And now at my house, I've got a commissioning report from uh, the guys that were there. Gary came out to my house to commission it from Zender. And now we've mm-hmm. got a, a Texas guy who's all trained up uh, yeah. and is in uh, you know an hour away from my job sites. He'll come out, he'll check every single register. It takes a little while because he's got to do it two or three times because once I tighten this one down, I'm like air, a bigger amount of airflow at a different location. So he's got to go around the house with the ladder three or four times. But when it's all said and done, this system that was just installed by a carpenter who wasn't necessarily trying to figure out some special distance or anything crazy on these pipes is all commissioned at the end. And now I've got a fresh air system that's actually delivering fresh air to the correct locations of my bedrooms, my public spaces, and we're exhausting from the wet and stinky locations. So all my bathrooms, uh, my laundry rooms, my water closets and my pantry in my case is the uh, is the final exhaust yep. and it's a balanced system i think it's genius and i love the <laughs> fact that really anybody can be trained to do it you don't have to be an hvac contractor you're not making weirdo metal duct connections you got to go to the sheet metal shop no everything gets shipped on a pallet to your job site and with just a little bit of training any crew can put it together you are correct the major secret like with every hvc installation air sealing Mm -hmm. so you want to be sure that all of the connections here at the registers or at the main manifold or on the big pipes are air sealed because obviously if i'm restricting the airflow at this register i'm pushing the air to somewhere else and if it can leak out it's not necessarily will go to the other register box yeah and that's what's cool about zender too is that they've really paid attention to making air sealed connections tight connections pretty straightforward like check this out this little uh you know device that's my termination it's got a double collar on there that air seals that just slips right on and once it's on it's an airtight connection uh the same is true with these sabi and actually uh show us do you have the grill for this one by the way so yes we have grills uh, for that time, I showed actually. you this one, which I forget what this is called. The Lumos grill, right? That's Luna. a Luna, Luna grill. Yep. I was close. This yep. is the Luna grill. They've also got some uh, pretty, Roma. S- pretty slick looking aroma grills. Thank you. Yep. Uh, yep. Which this could be a really nice ceiling or wall mounted grill. And this could be supply or exhaust, right? It's both. Yes, you are correct. So it could be supply or uh, exhaust if it's an exhaust. We're always using filters on the exhaust ports because we're protecting yeah. the distribution system. Just imagine in the kitchen when you start to pulling the air from cooking, you don't want those grease getting into the distribution. Yep. So oh, we have that's a, really a big subject right there. Yep. There's a big subject. There is yeah. And then and Sabi, I see you've got a little comfort set in there. Do you got a comfort set in there? Is that what's I put in it there? in. So yeah. this is a, a genius idea. No moving parts. Yeah. Airflow restriction, it's a bunch of straws <laughs> in the run shape of yeah. the connection. And how we restrict the airflow is we're just changing the washer on the top it's of it. little washer diameter. Yeah, so, you know, on Matt's house, right, he's got, you know, he's got a few bedrooms and then he's got a, a pantry and, you know, the pantry is maybe a supply or a, a return area and stuff like that. And then so somebody looked at Matt's house and said, gee, you know, let's do 24 CFM in the master and 8 CFM return air in the pantry. And then we put in one of those boxes that Sabi had. And then how do we actually go from 12 CFM per tube down to eight? We do it by doing those, operating those flow restrictors. And in the Luna grills, it's the twist and turn that that Matt was doing. And in the uh, square TVA boxes, it's that little genius flow restrictor that Sabi pointed out. And so the installer secrets are, you know, when you look at the designs and each tube is sized in, in 
average conditions, you know, in runs under 30, 35 feet or something like that to carry 12 CFM, as long as we don't turn it into a spiral spring with a 90 and a 90 and a 90 and a 90, right? If we have nice, smooth, even bends, we can rely on that 12 CFM. If we got to go from one end of Matt's house all the way to the other, because it's a big long house and that's where we got to go, then the only thing is we might think about how much static is on that really long length. And if we got a room that wants two tubes by design, so two at 12 or two at 10 CFM, let's just maybe put a third tube in there to kind of spread that to reduce the overall static of the flow across three tubes instead of two. And that's how we wind up getting ourselves out of trouble. I see some projects that I commissioned myself and we'll look at some installed projects here in a, in a minute. Um, but they just, you know, they, they had to go from the basement where the unit is all the way to the top floor. And, and you know, it, the design is having a little bit of trouble because they had to go twist and turn and twist and turn to get there. Um, and so one of the ways to do that is just, well, just back up, add another tube, another 12 CFM allowance that lowers the static across all tubes and we can get our flow because the unit's got plenty of capacity to give the flow. It's just all in running the distribution in a way that will get us the flow where we want it. And then once it's there, it's just tuning each room by adjusting the termination and the and somebody with a flow hood that lets, literally just puts the hood over the termination and reads the flow and makes an adjustment. So uh, with that, maybe I'll just throw uh, more pictures up here. Um, this is in my house. This picture might actually be in Allison Bale's new book, um, mm -hmm. Do Buildings Breathe? Or Do People Breathe? Or He's got a good title. I'm Do just Houses Need to Breathe? The moment. Right? Yeah, there you go. Right. So um, so this is my the house I'm living in right now, which is an old, you know, it's not an old house by East Coast standard, but by West Coast, it's, you know, about 80 years old. And and so um, it had a forced air system. And first thing we did is moved in and ripped out the forced air system. And I used that all that ducting material to run my ventilation system. Because, you know, once you once you have really good ventilation, you just, you know, you just don't go back. It's just you've crossed Rubicon and that's part of life now. <laughs> so I, I just set this in the basement and I figured out how to run my duct runs. Uh, that big black tube is actually the exhaust flow given the air to the outside. Mm. And where the old oil burning furnace was, there was the chimney. And so I actually just ducted that and it goes right into the chimney, straight up the chimney to the outdoors. Works great. Hit my static numbers, all good. Um, and then routed my fresh air through a crawl space to the outdoor. And then I just took all that comfort flex, set my silencers, and in this case, um, I'm in the Northwest. We got fires now, it's smoky and nasty. So I put in a fine particle filter to knock down some of that particulate. It's on the supply side rather than the fresh air side, which is a whole interesting discussion about condensation and where's the right place to put fine particle filters. Um, in any case, it's up and running. Um, it does great. It's a Q series, which is self-balancing, which means um it was even less work starting it up and managing it um and then my partner uh business partner bill hayward he's got a couple of ca 550s in his basement serving a house that he built serving two different zones and he and i are both into this stuff right so i mean a mechanical room is now a place where we entertain the truly <laughs> i love it so, bill's having like a meeting down in his mech room yeah, in all seriousness, this was a meeting. I was there. I took the picture, which is <laughs> which is uh, why I can use it. But these are all people I, we're talking about good buildings. And and so, you know, some, some of the things that he did in this house was hand selected the building material to go in to get the lowest VOC and um, and reducing reduce as much off gassing potential or harmful off gassing that he could. And he's got a slug of monitoring equipment. The data out of it is super interesting. Um, and the data output actually included a period where he turned off the ventilation system hmm. and then saw the VOC count um, go sky high. It was amazing. Super tight house, no ventilation. All of a sudden, all that new construction equipment, even the wood, the plywood, all of that, um, 
you know, there's a lot of things in there that are off gassing nasty things. That's wild. And with no ventilation, they accumulated and they peaked out pretty high at an alarming level. Turn on the ventilation system, they drop like a rock. Um, and it came back into, you know, some really nice zones. It just talks about how important ventilation is in new construction or existing construction. Um, super nice. This is the classic passive house mechanical room. It's got a Zender HRV, a CA350 in this case. It's got a Sandin Sanco2 CO2 water heater, the super efficient one. And this house literally needs, I don't know, maybe 5,000, 6,000 BTU an hour at its design temperature in the Jeez, Northwest. Nothing. <laughs> and so we can just take a branch off of that Sanco2, give it to that green Take OX block up there and send it to the floor. And that's literally our heating system. Oh my So it's gosh. an HRV. That's crazy. It's a little water heater. And that's the whole system, nothing else. So I mean, it's expensive, you know, because it's a it's a it's an R40 building enclosure, roughly. Uh, so we're spending a little bit on the envelope, but when we get back into the mechanicals, it's it's not so much. Um, the house on the right is that that awesome builder uh, in Bellingham, Washington, um, timber frame shop. And uh, they just do plain good work. And then the one on the left, I, I think that's in Boise, Idaho. That is just one of the most beautiful installs I've ever seen. Pretty. It's properly labeled. It's a beautiful thing. You can see that it's got a filter on the right-hand side, just above that yellow tag. Mm -hmm. There's an extra little door. That's a fine particle filter. So it goes, supplier goes through that silencer, knocks the noise down, hits the filter, knocks the particles down, and then goes into those white tubes and wherever it's off and going. If we don't like the look of the silencer, we can hide it up in the ceiling and just run some black tube through the drywall and then hide the confusing mess of spaghetti up there. On the right, there's a bracket that'll just drop the silencer right on top of whatever unit we're using. There's brackets for all sizes. And you can see the black cover is down and there's a little screen and that's where we actually program in the flow. So if I, if I show up to Matt's house and Matt says, okay, I'm ready for some flow, um, and he says, hey, my system's designed for 180 CFM continuous. I'll just enter in the commissioning wizard on that. I'll find the dial. I'll turn 180 into a number in cubic feet per minute or cubic feet per hour uh, in a metric code. And I'll key that number in and then the machine will dial in and start running at that number and, and self-balance. Super cool. Uh, climate in this case the one on the left's cold climate needs dehumidification because it's super cold and dry and i think this was in edmonton alberta gets a bit cold up there you know unlike the north or very much like the northeast this is what we do there a 550 added dehumidifier on the right hand side um simple sweet little ca350 install Here's where things get a little interesting, and there's a couple of interesting projects here. Uh, the one on the left is a is a full-on passive house in Vancouver, and and every once in a while the challenges mount and the flow wants to go some funny places, and if you wind up if if it looks complicated and you have a hard time following the pipes, that means you probably got some more static than you need and you're gonna have trouble. And we actually had trouble getting the flow because mm -hmm. of the static and and, and how we could convince the flow to move where we wanted it to go. So we had to actually pull that unit out, replace it with a 550 to overcome higher static. We did it, we got the flow, it's working. The one on the left looks a little, um, you know, it's got some interesting angles to a guy like me that likes plumb and square. Um, but it works. It worked just great. You know, it just speaks to how adaptable these things really are. Hey, Albert, uh, let me uh, let me cut yeah, you off for ahead. one second, brother. We are running short on time. I've oh, got yeah, uh, I got five till, and we've got a bunch of questions. I'm going to boil them let's, down to just a few. But let's switch to quick Q and A if that's all right. Yeah, yeah, no problem, man. Yeah. Uh, Sabi, this might be a question for you or Albert. I could see you answering this as well. Uh, and I'm, I'm this is. I'm kind of boiling down three or four questions into one, but this is really uh, uh, Rimvis Mounty's question, which is, what if I 
What if I want to use your equipment, Zender equipment, but I don't want to use the ducting system from Zender? I want to use my own ducting system. Is that a possibility? Could I run the fresh air through my HVAC system ducts? It's a very <clears throat> great question. And obviously, we would love if you could use our system. However, if you can't afford it or you don't have space to run the piping, that's actually lately a pretty big challenge with the new constructions when there are huge openings on the first floor and there is no interior walls to run the ducting. So, yes, you can hook it up to our uh, our system, to your central ductwork. Uh, technically, you not necessarily will get the airflow room by room what we designed mm -hmm. because you're dumping 160, 150 CFM for a ductwork which has been designed for 1,000 or 1,200 CFM. Right. But you're still moving the air and you're still buying the best equipment on the market. So instead of buying a lower yeah. efficient unit and using that for fresh air ventilation, you still can hook up our unit and you still get the ventilation result. However, it's not necessarily targeted. And, uh, and, and this wasn't someone's questions, but it's something that Sabi and I had talked about earlier that I want to bring up, which is, you know, when you get a quote back from Zender, when you get a small planet supply quote, sometimes people are like, oh my gosh, you know, I spent uh, $4,000 on my last DRV or 3000 Why is this so much more? And, and the reason is they've got all of the parts and pieces that go with the system, not just the engine. So instead of just buying, you know, a V8 engine for your truck, you're buying the whole chassis and the distribution and the, and the uh, transmission as well from exactly Zender. Right. Uh, so you yep. can't just look at an apples to apples. Oh, this is the Panasonic price. This is whatever price. Because honestly, if you look just apples to apples, here's how much the engine costs, the ERV or the HRV. They're really not that different. They're not that much more expensive. Maybe a little bit more because you are getting some. They're a little bit. Yeah, they're a little bit more because the industry average is going to be like 60 to 75 percent effectiveness. Right. And a sender unit is going to be right around 90 yeah. percent. And the, you know, that there's a cost difference there. Yep. Uh, on the scope of things, it's you know it might be like a thousand bucks or something like that, but yeah. that's not crazy because in BTU and comfort over time, uh, the difference between sixty and seventy five percent, ninety percent is really really big. That's right. Uh, yeah, and so at, Matt, if 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 it ever hits zero degree or thirty two degrees freezing outside at your house and you're at seventy inside, um, there's a delta T between those two brackets. And 60% recovery which means that that 60% of that delta T is only going to be recovered, which means you're going to have cold flows into your master bedroom that are really cold. That's right. Uncomfortable. Yeah. And if you if you get to 90%, that delta T becomes really small. Pretty small. And those flows are no longer comfortable. They're they're okay. And and I would tell you from my own experience, that's exactly what I found in my house, Albert. Last winter when we had some pretty cold temps. And by cold temps, I mean 30 out right? in Austin. Sure. It's not yeah, usually right. that cold. But let's yeah. say my indoor air is 70, so it, the delta is 40 degrees. Uh, I thought, oh, I'm going to run my system on boost mode all night long to cool down my house. Well, I did that. I ran it on boost mode. I can set it on my, uh, on my Zender app yep. on my phone. Yep. I set it for eight hours overnight. I wasn't even able to bring my temperature down one degree overnight. Yeah. Uh, in my house. Right. I have a great envelope. I'm very airtight and my system's yeah. 90, 88, 90 percent uh, effective at moving both moisture and uh, heat, enthalpy and heat. So yeah. I didn't gain anything hardly at my house overnight, except I had extra fresh air. Well, and it's a funny thing, Matt. So we call these things heat recovery ventilators or enthalpy recovery ventilators. And you're really in a cooling climate mm -hmm. and it works exactly the same. We call yep. them heat recovery ventilators because they were made in, in cold places on <laughs> earth, right? <laughs> but it actually works. What you're talking about in the summer is the same scenario. That's the right. higher efficiency means that you, you need less cooling in the summer to yep. maintain those interior temperatures. That's yes, right. Physics works both ways. Phys yeah, and dehumidification uh, on that point too. I need less too. dehumidification. Yes. I do want yep. to make the point though, and I don't. I don't. I think it's worth on every webinar we talk about it. Uh, I I hear often people saying, "Oh, I'm going to put a zender in, or I'm going to put a fresh air system, and now I don't need a dehumidifier if I'm in the south." 
Uh, and that is not true. This is not a dehumidifier. Uh, it this is will not. not dehumidify. If anything, it's going to add some humidity to your house because remember, it's still uh even it's if it's 90 percent effective 10 percent of that moisture still might come yep. in correct uh, yep. so when you build a tight house you're still going to maybe have a little bit of extra grains of moisture coming in than if you had no ventilation system let's say on a very tight house so you still need in my mind a dehumidification system completely agree absolutely so completely agree we have great we need- softwares what we can use now for manual j calculation which gives you the latent load and the sensible load you just have to type in the proper information to the proper section and manual J will give you what is your load. Yep. We unfortunately, because it's not a dehumidifier, we only recovering the delta, mm-hmm. certain percentage, it's still bringing in some humidity for you. Yep. But it's much better than just opening the window or using 100%. straight bathroom fence, pumping air out, creating negative pressure. So much better. Uh, I can't remember whose question it was, and I'm going to summarize it just in the interest of time. But Albert, someone asked the question, uh, how do you design an HVAC manual J equipment sizing and ventilation when you don't know really what the tightness of the building is going to be at the design phase? I'm curious from your perspective on. So it doesn't, it, it really doesn't matter, right? So, so air tightness on buildings is, is always a variable and they're never 100% tight. Yep. And ventilation is really about people in space. Mm-hmm. Um, and because the air tightness is going to change, our approach is to provide appropriate ventilation based on occupants and what what exhaust rates we need, because we need the exhaust rates to manage the bathroom and the kitchen and things like that. Um, and so if the house is 12 air, air changes an hour or 14 like mine, I still do the same rate because some days it's our calm and the temperatures in a range where um, stack effect isn't really doing much. Uh, and some days are windy. And when the hin- wind hits my house, then I've got the ven- Zender ventilation and then a whole lot more. <laughs> um, but in all cases, right, the, the climate... Uh, the conditions always change. So we start with a baseline, assuming um, that we need to pr- provide proper ventilation for occupants and we need to pull air out of kitchens and bath and manage that moisture. Yeah, love it. Yeah, the normal goal, what we use at Zender is we want to exchange the total volume of the building in every three, four hours. So we're looking yeah. between 0.25 to 0.35 ACH based on the conditioned volume. Yep. So... If you take that, technically you're exchanging the air in the house six, seven times a day. Per the course of 24 hours. Correct. Yeah. Yeah. yeah um, cool. We're running short on time, but I don't want to leave without telling people that are watching this. Uh, first off, how they could get a quote on a system, how they could figure out what it, what it would be to get the equipment for their house. Uh, and I'd actually like kind of both of you guys to explain uh, on the small planet supply and also on the Zender side how that works at various parts of North America. Yeah, great. You want to go so first? Zabi, let me start. About, uh, <clears throat> everything starts with Zabi. Uh, <laughs> Zabi. So we have a website, zenderamerica.com, and uh, we have a task on the website. It says request a quote. So technically, when you click on the task, you have to upload for us your floor plan. I would like to emphasize that we would like to get some detailed floor plans it's easier for us to work with if i see the proper numbers and i can calculate the proper proper volume of the building instead of a hand sketch (laughs) however i have customers who doing retrofit they don't have professional plans so they're doing a hand scratch with numbers it can work so you submit to us the requested documentation and if you have any extra notes for us let know that you want extra cfm in certain parts of the house you submit it to us normally we're returning your quote within two weeks 10 business days we try to do our best that's pretty and, good uh, we try to if you have any question obviously you can call us email us we're discussing the project talk yeah. with your mechanical engineer or with your architect if you want to bring those people in we, our goal is to help you and be sure that your system will be designed properly and it's working properly so you as a customer is satisfied with our product love it Albert, and then I'm every up. once in a while, Sabi will hand off uh, a quote to us because we only work in the Western U.S. and Western Canada, and actually, I'm sorry, uh, also the Maritimes in Canada. 
So Savi will see a quote come in and say, hey, that's for Arizona. Um, and he'll hand that off to Small Planet and we'll get all that information. And part of our team will look at it and um, and start working on it and then reach out to whoever's project it is and start talking to them about their ventilation system. That works for a single family, a tiny house, uh, works for a multifamily building. Uh, we, we work on them and all, all, we work on all of them. And, um, and we've just been a, you know, a, a super great partner uh, with Zender for about 10 years now. Um, and um, and so we're always excited when we hear from Zavi because it's more work to do. That's right. We are definitely happy for all of the distributors in the United States. Small Planet is one of our distributors up there on the Northwest. And uh, we have distributor here in Texas. And in states when we do not have distributors, we are taking care of the quotes for the customers. And uh, as you mentioned before, the quote includes technically all of the parts. If you paid for the project, uh, for the parts, we're packing up everything into one big box and it's becoming like a Lego. Yeah. With it's your big, shop right. It's a big Lego set. And all of the parts are coming together. I enjoyed my house when I put it together. Uh, my eight years old son helped me. It was fun. So. And I would tell you from a contractor's perspective, we've done four now uh, in Texas in my houses. I did my personal house and I've done three others. Uh, once you've done one, done it once or twice, you've totally lost the whole, oh my gosh, I'm a yep. little concerned. I'm a little worried. Like, how's this going to come together? Now I'm super excited, super excited. It's really straightforward. I understand it. So if you're watching this, you've never done one before. Don't be afraid to reach out to Zender, to reach out yeah, to Small Planet, afraid. any of these companies. They would love to help you. They'll point you in the direction. There's lots of YouTube videos out there besides mine even that I watch a bunch of them, how to install them, what it looks like. And again, the first time I saw it, it was a carpentry crew installing it for a builder. The builder sourced it from Zender Direct, or probably from Small Planet, actually. Everything got delivered to the job site. The carpentry crew put it all in in like the course of a day and a half. And then you're going to get a third party person who's been trained with Zender, maybe even a Zender person, out there to commission it at the end and make sure everything's working correctly. So this is a very, very unique system. And... Is it more than your $2,500 ERV you might have put in the past? Yes, you're getting way more. You're not just buying, as I uh, I like this analogy, I just came up with it. You're not just buying the engine, you're buying the whole car. And this is your V in your system. So now you can take out the V and let your HVAC guy do his normal hack job. And you can take care of the V job. That was a HVAC joke. I'm sorry. HVAC contractors, <laughs> H AC hack job. Sorry. Yeah, now yeah, they can yeah. do their work. You're your crew can do the zender fresh air and then if you're in the south i would recommend you have a dehumidifier in the house as well and i like having systems that do their own things separately that aren't all tied together yeah. i'm not a yeah. big fan of magic box systems that do this and that and the other thing if my zender goes down i still have my full hvac system if my dehumidifier goes down i still have my zender and my hvac system all three are totally separate totally serviceable uh, easy to service, easy to change filters. Uh, it's a phenomenal system, and, and I couldn't be happier to uh, uh, to partner with Zender and uh, do some work on the Build Show talking about this particular process. I don't want to leave, though, before I go back to you, Albert, uh, from Small Planet. Albert, would you also just give us a quick Small Planet supply plug? What else do you guys do? Because you guys do more than just ventilation, right? Uh, yeah, we do. We do. We attempt to do quite a bit. Uh, founded the company after uh, 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 started as a cabinet maker. I was 14 years old, working in a cabinet shop, and did a bunch of things. And in, and um, a bunch of friends uh, who are now friends. I didn't know them well at first, but they wanted to build passive houses in North America. And so we brought in Sega from Europe and introduced it to you back in 2012 or so, Matt. Um, we do air tightness products, we do Zender, we do heat pump water heaters, uh, and we're on a, um, a big endeavor, uh, endeavor right now with uh, two research projects uh, funded in Canada, uh, which look at using phase change material, hydrated salts, as a thermal storage device to help start managing 
um, managing hot water loads across uh, utilities. And then we also make some very, very big, kind of like big pickup size heat pump water heaters that are all on a big package that will serve um, 100 unit apartment buildings or 150 unit apartment buildings. We set up a um, uh, a brand new manufacturing facility in Tumwater, Washington to do that. So we're working on little buildings uh, and big buildings. We started importing cork uh, in that tiny house. It was yeah. sited with actually natural cork. We've been importing cork in North America, started the brand name Thermacork, which is now on the market for almost 10 years now. Uh, as core insulation, and um, we got a website. There's a bunch of stuff on the website, but um, we just like to do really interesting things that solve problems um, around high performance buildings and efficiency. So, and fortunately, there's there's a lot of need out there. So we got plenty to do. Yeah, there is big time. Uh, to any of you who paid uh, or jumped in live on the Q and A, uh, we had an overwhelming number of questions. I'm sorry we couldn't get to them all, uh, but I don't want to leave you without some answers for those. Uh, so, Sabi, what's a good way to get a hold of Zender to ask questions on these systems or talk to someone at Zender? Uh, is there somebody that, uh, or is there a number? Is there a way that people could get a hold of somebody? So our, <clears throat> our availability is on our website. You can send email to just a regular generic email address, info at zenderamerica.com. Or if you already worked with us, you have one of our email or phone number and uh, just give us a call, send us an email or just call the main office and they will transfer you to the right person. Awesome. Obviously, everybody has its own rule within the company. Yep. And uh, yep. And if you're yep. west of the Rockies, give... Uh... Allplanetsupply.com and you'll see our phone number. Give us a ring or sales.usa at smallplanetsupply.com. There you go. Guys, don't be afraid to reach out to them because once you meet these folks at a trade show, get to know them. Uh, you know, these are, um, these are great companies that are amazing resources. Uh, and the more friends you have in the network of mm -hmm. high-performance builders, yeah. suppliers, manufacturers... The more you it's realize people sport. are people are willing to help. Uh, and yeah. I'll apologize ahead of time if you email me because I get way too many emails and uh, direct messages. I can't answer them all in the course of a human's lifetime. Um, but don't be afraid to reach out to these companies, to all the other folks that you see in the build share, because uh, this high performance building network that I'm a part of, that you're a part of, uh, it's really a very, very giving community. And people really, truly care about uh, rising the tide that floats all boats. And I would say, uh, incidentally, that as I've traveled around the U.S., more and more builders, more and more architects, more and more homeowners care and are willing to put the time into building, remodeling, designing really cool houses that are healthy, that are durable, that are supplying fresh filtered air to all the bedrooms. This stuff that we're talking about here is making a real impact in the industry and a real impact in families' lives. Uh, around the U.S. and family's health around the U.S. And I'm super excited to have finally built for my own family uh, a healthy house. My daughter, who has uh, grown up with asthma, uh, suddenly hasn't needed her inhaler in the last year that we've been in our new house. So there are real and tangible benefits to building better houses with good ventilation, with good filtration. Uh, this is really making a difference in people's lives. That's awesome. Uh, Sabi, Albert, really appreciate you guys uh, taking the time. And thank you for tuning in, whether you are live or whether you're watching this later. Uh, and uh, remember, we do these webinars about once a month. If you'll sign up for our newsletter, there'll be something below somewhere that'll allow you to sign up for our newsletter. You can get a notification of future newsletters. But as always, follow us on TikTok or Instagram. Otherwise, we'll see you next time on The Build Show webinar. <laughs>